you have a Bible, would you please turn to John chapter 13? John chapter 13, verses 1 through 20. Beginning in verse 1. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, <clears throat> having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During supper, when the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments and taking a towel, tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered him, what I am doing, you do not understand now, but you will understand. Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, if I do not wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, the one who has bathed does not need to wash except for his feet. But it's completely clean. And you are clean, but not every one of you. For he knew who was going to betray him. That was why he said, not all of you were clean. When he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, do you understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. I'm not speaking of all of you. I know whom I have chosen, but the scripture will be fulfilled. He who ate my bread has lifted his heel against me. I'm telling you this now before it takes place, that when it does take place, you may believe that I am he. <laughs> truly, truly, I say to you, whoever receives the one I send receives me, and whoever receives me receives the one who sent me. We have uh, been viewing these 20 verses, I guess, five weeks now, and learning from them doctrine. We've been learning theology from these verses. The doctrine of God's love in verse 1, the humiliation of Christ, the theology of the cross, and Christian service. And from these theological points, we have learned how theology applies to our life and how it permeates our life and how really our, our, our theology leads to how we worship. And this morning, we will continue focusing in once again on God's love and the theology of God's love, but this time seen through the lens of election. Recently, I observed a dis from a distance, I wasn't part of a discussion, but I, I, I was... Uh, able to witness a discussion about what a Christian should focus in on. And one person made the, the comment or the statement that we as Christians should only focus on the love and compassion of Jesus and forget about theology. And I'm sure there were many that gave a hearty amen to that. Another person responded correctly to the first statement that the very idea of Christ's love and compassion is in and of itself a theological statement. And we cannot understand that apart from how the scripture guides us in how we understand Christ's love. You see, there are a lot of ideas floating around about out there about who God is. And many of these statements are made from those 
that would consider themselves to be evangelical Christians, a term which really means very little today, just watch politics when they reference how evangelicals are thinking. But nonetheless, many statements made by professing Christians are made, and they are made with no qualification of meaning behind the statements, of what that means that God is love. Oftentimes it's separated from the other attributes of God as if we could separate and divide God up into these little compartments. And this happens from true believers. This happens from those that believe they are believers. It just happens. God is love. God is compassionate. How that's usually translated today is typically that God wants me to be happy. And a statement that really, in, in my opinion, is a theological landmine, and it's a landmine for uh, waiting to destroy a person in their life, to operate on this basis that, well, God wants me to be happy so I can just do whatever I want. God is love, you know. What does it mean that God is love or that God is compassionate? What if these ideas, which are true, they are true, do not mean entirely what our society claims or believes that they mean? You know, one of the most influential Christians of the last hundred years is Billy Graham. Wouldn't you agree? One, according to one historian, Ian Murray, one of Graham's most frequently repeated sayings from 1957 onwards was this. The badge of Christian discipleship is not orthodoxy, but love. That saying has permeated our Christian culture in a way that is absent from theological consideration. And quite frankly, it's been disastrous. It's been disastrous in the way we think. It's been disastrous in the way it's manifested itself in so many churches all over, and none of us have escaped it. What if Christ's love for his own manifested itself in suffering? What if Christ's compassion is revealed in the warnings that there's coming persecution, in which he repeatedly told his disciples? What if being persecuted and suffering was actually a sign of God's blessing in our life? What if we see Christ exalted in these things? What if these things that teach us this and taught us this, that our best life really isn't now, and praise God that my best life isn't now? What if we see that in God's love and suffering and persecution, all of these things that, that we strive for in materialistic possessions, what, what if we learn that those things are really not signs of always blessing? Because they are going to perish. What if striving for the things that do not touch eternity are a waste of our time? See, I believe our passage this morning, we're going to be looking at verses 18 through 20 primarily. I believe our passage this morning teaches us something of the, all of the above. But in ways that we're not used to thinking about or even recognizing, we learn about, uh, we've learned about election in these verses. And in, the, in verses 18 through 20, we see election here. Have I, have I not chosen you, he says? Well, we see two very different types of election that are presented in this passage here. We see the love and mercy of God in election. We see the deity of Christ in these passages and in the fact that he said he's the one who does the choosing. And we see that perseverance is directly tied to our election. These are all theological propositions. They're all difficult to understand. If we desire to know God, we have to only go as far as he has revealed to himself to us in his son as recorded in his word. And his word is sufficient for teaching us. So when we try to understand concepts like God is love or election, trying to understand it through human reasoning rather than through scripture is a fatal mistake. In other words, if we divorce scripture from what we believe about God or even interpret God according to to our own fancy, let me tell you, we will simply hang God on a cross when we are forced to see him as revealed in the Bible. Our passage, again, verses 18 through 20, is primary focus this morning, and in this we're introduced again to the doctrine of election. Here we again, we see two different forms of election that are very different. How do we understand election? Anyone that reads the Bible seriously will admit that there is an elect, and no one denies that. 
How do we understand that? How is that understood will vary between people in different churches and denominations. It's common to take a biblical idea like election and bring philosophy in to interpret what election is rather than allowing the Bible to inform us. And this has always been the problem of interpreting Scripture. Rather than allowing Scripture to interpret Scripture, we interpret it according to reason, rationalism, philosophy. Not to say that those things are not important. You see, the basis of liberalism in Christianity was rooted in interpreting Scripture by means of human reason. It happened after the Reformation, where the Bible was no longer the inerrant word of God, because it didn't make sense to us. <clears throat> what does that do? It makes man the authority, doesn't it? it? makes man the authority of God. And so as we look this morning, we need to look and see what Scripture says to us in of itself. Look at verse 18 with me. I'm not speaking of all of you. I know whom I have chosen, but the scripture will be fulfilled. He who ate my bread has lifted his heel against me. Now the first thing in this verse, in verse 18, is that we notice is that not all of the twelve are beneficiaries of Christ's blessing. Isn't that correct? Because he's speaking to the twelve in this upper room, and as he's speaking to them, it's tied to verse 17. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. I'm not speaking of all of you. In other words, not all of the twelve are going to be beneficiaries of this blessing that Christ has talked about in verse 17. Verse 18 is tied to that. Now the first thing is that I would want to look at and ask is this, what would these words have meant to the twelve as a whole? As they hear Jesus say these words, what would the twelve have thought? I think it's clear from other passages that we read of this upper room is they would be asking the question, is it I, Lord? You say that not all of us are going to be participants of your grace. Is it I? Is it I that could possibly be not one of your own disciples? Could it be I that is truly not of faith? Is it I, Lord? That would have been a question that many of them, if not all, at least the 11, would have asked. Mm -hmm. Is it I? What should this have meant for Judas as he heard these words? I think it means this is, your treachery is inexcusable. Jesus has already said, not all of you are clean. He said in chapter 6, something else of Judas. He says, here again, I, I know whom I've chosen, not all of you. I'm not speaking of all of you. Not all of you are a part of this. I know, Judas, what you're about to do. And later Jesus says, do it quickly. Judas is inexcusable. You know, if you ever wonder, why didn't Jesus just call Judas out there? Can you imagine Peter and Judas being in the same room when Peter found out about Judas' treachery? Yeah. What will this mean when they realize that Judas was the betrayer? And Jesus has told them this. What will this mean when they realize it? What will this mean when Jesus is crucified, when he goes to the cross? It means this, is they can look back on this event, and they will look back on this event, and they will know that Jesus had warned them, that Jesus had told them, this is going to happen to me. When they are on the cross and afterward, or when they, Jesus is on the cross and they're, they're, they've scattered and they're afraid and they're frightened and they're confused, and, and, and later as they are, are off on their own missionary work and they're frightened and they're scared out there all by themselves, they can look back and say, Jesus warned us he knew what was going on. There was never a moment that he wasn't in control, that he didn't know what was going on. And Jesus states, I'm not speaking of all of you. This is an act of love for his own. What comfort to the, to the disciples to know, looking back on this very confusing time for them to know, Jesus knew what was going on. It, it, was, all, it was all working out according to God's plan. He knew. He told us. We, we just didn't see it. But now we see. Jesus knew the entire time. Let me tell you, that is comfort. That is comfort to look back and say, God is in control. I didn't understand the circumstances, but he did. He even told us. 
It's followed by a, another amazing statement that Jesus says. He says, I know whom I have chosen. Now the natural instinct when we read this phrase is to interpret that Jesus chose the eleven. And Judas Iscariot was not among the chosen. That's our first inclination, I think. At least that's my first inclination when I read those words. I know whom I've chosen. Okay, he chose the eleven. But Judas is not chosen, clearly. But in fact, that would be incorrect. Judas was chosen. Just not in the same manner in which the eleven were chosen. If you look at chapter 6, verse 70, Jesus answered, Did I not choose you, who? The twelve? He doesn't say, Did I choose you, the eleven? He says, did I not choose you, the twelve? And then what does he do? He says, and yet, one of you is a devil. They were all chosen. All twelve of the disciples were chosen. The eleven were recipients of Jesus' love, his salvific love, and that they were saved and that they were given faith. They were given a love of Christ that would carry them through their Christian life. As Jesus, uh, we learn in verse 1, is that Jesus had loved his own who were in the world. He loved them to the end. They, They persevered because of his love. Judas did not persevere. Now how must we understand this is that God had not called Judas effectually to salvation. Yet Judas was still a recipient of goodness and gifts and much mercy and grace in life, wasn't he? And many temporal gifts. He went out preaching on a preaching ministry with the other disciples and their evangelism, sharing the good news. He was part of that. He was part of the working so much so that the disciples never knew or suspected a thing of Judas. And that's why they asked the question, is it I? Because they didn't all, when Jesus says, one of you is a betrayer, they didn't all point to Judas because they had no idea it was Judas. They, they pointed the finger at themselves and says, it is, is it I? So what do we see? He was clearly gifted. He was clearly blessed in this life. But he was not a recipient of God's saving grace. But he was chosen. There are clearly two sides to election. That word chosen, by the way, is the same word as election. All 12 disciples were elect, but not in the same way. I want you to notice what Paul writes in Romans chapter 9, verses 20 through 23. But who are you, O man, to answer back to God? Will what is molded say to its molder, "Why, why have you made me like this? Has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for dishonorable use? What if God, desiring to show his wrath and to make known his power, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction? In order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy which he has prepared before him for glory. God say that he's the potter. We are the clay. We we don't look back to God and say, why? Well, I mean, we do. We do say, why? As if we could say that to God. Earlier in chapter 9 of Romans, this idea is expressed in terms of God having mercy and compassion on whom he wills according to his prerogative. I will have mercy on whom I have mercy. Yet notice there, the phrase that's in here, that there are vessels that are prepared for destruction. That oftentimes does not sit well. Now I want you to notice something, how Judas is described elsewhere in John's Gospel. In the high priestly prayer of John chapter 17, the the most common way we hear it is that Judas is the son of perdition, right? Well, the ESV translates that destruction because that's the actual... Greek word there, the same one that's used in Romans, it is the same word, son of destruction or vessel of destruction. We see the same phrase there. As Paul teaches in Romans 9, this is really not an isolated incident in Scripture, what takes place with Judas. Judas. 
fact, in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 15, it teaches us that both David and Saul, King David and Saul, the Old Testament, they were both chosen according to God's purposes, were they not? David was loved to the end. David messed up because that was the way to go. But God loved him to the end. David was loved to the end where Saul was given temporal gifts, temporal love, temporal goodness, temporal grace. At the end, he fell. The struggle for most people at this point is that if that's true, if that's really what Scripture says, then we can blame God for evil. God's responsible for evil. Yet how can that accusation stand or be justifiable? That we can say that. It can only be confirmed. Listen. You can only impugn God for that if you believe man is without sin. If man is without sin, and man wasn't born into sin, and then we look at these passages, then we can say, well, then God implanted sin in man. But you first have to start with the premise that man is without sin. We couldn't do that, could we? But then consider how God operates. The Old Testament, Jeremiah 25, where we're told Babylonians are coming. They're going to destroy this place. Now let me ask you a question. Did God have to convince King Nebuchadnezzar to come into Israel and take it over as a king? Or did a king that was bent on power have those inclinations to do that himself? I mean, think about the soldiers that were, 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 were going into Judah and, and destroying it. Did those soldiers, did God have to put in them a desire for nationalistic zeal, honor, a thirst for blood? No. That was already who they were. It's what is interesting is God says, I'm going to use them to punish you, and then after 70 years, what? I'm going to punish them. You see, God didn't have to put anything in anybody for them to act that way. Amen. See, it's a view to, to, to think that it really takes a, a high estimation of man. As if God has to work evil in a person for them to be a vessel of destruction. It denies the reality that by nature of being a son of Adam, mankind is already born a vessel of destruction. God doesn't have to do that. It's already in man. How God works in the elect for salvation is that the Holy Spirit regenerates that person, new birth. Look at John chapter 3, conversation with Nicodemus. What must I be, do to be saved? You must be born again. How do I do that? Well, you must be born again. What did you have to do with your birth? Nothing. It's the same thing for those, I mean, it's not the same way for those that are not elect. God doesn't work in a person so that they're not saved. They are already not saved. Nothing new was added to Judas. No sin was put into Judas for Judas to be a betrayer. It was already who Judas was. Nor was anything new implanted in Pharaoh or Saul or Esau. Or anyone that's not saved. God doesn't put anything in anyone. So when we read Jesus say, I know whom I've chosen. It doesn't mean Judas was among, not among the elect. He was among the elect, just not among the elect to salvation. Just not among the elect to salvation. Now, what are the implications of this? How does this affect us today? Number one, it should give us pause and lead us to ask ourselves the question, am I of the faith? Jesus was speaking to the twelve that were with him. And I, I said this recently, you, you could have heard the greatest preaching of your life and it will fall way short of hearing Jesus' preaching. Amen. Yet there was one of them that was not saved, that sat under directly Jesus' teaching. It should lead us to pause and ask the question, am I of the faith? Number two, if you are of the faith, 
quite frankly, this option, uh, uh, doctrine of election, it should lead you to worship. Because you have to ask the question, why would God choose me? I cannot, I, frankly, I cannot think of one reason why God would choose me. I, I cannot think of one reason why I would be among the elect. On my best day, all I bring is sin. It is only by the power of Christ and the blood of Christ that one day when I have to stand before a holy God that is Christ in which I'm able to be saved. Not because of me. There's nothing in me that would make God desire me. If anyone can answer the question, well, I can think of a reason why God would choose me. Please see me after the service. <laughs> Number third, third thing is this, is we should recognize the love of God in our election. We are feeble. We are weak need. With fleshly desires for sin. John Calvin said the slightest wind can change our direction. But thanks be to God that our perseverance and faith is directly tied to our election in Him because it is Him standing guard over our salvation because God loves His own to the end. Number four, Jesus has stated to have chosen His own. And Jesus said, I have chosen you. Elsewhere it says that the Father has chosen them and the Father will bring them. This is a clear statement of Christ's deity. This is a clear statement of the deity of Christ when he says, yet I have chosen you. So as we come back to this passage, then Jesus goes and he quotes Psalm 41, verse 19. He says, but the scripture will be fulfilled. He who ate my bread has lifted his heel against me. And Jesus is aware that he is the fulfillment of the Davidic line, the suffering king. He also demonstrates his role as a prophet here, doesn't he? He says something that scripture is going to fulfill. We know of Jesus as being king, priest, prophet. And Judas, we're told, and his treachery was a fulfillment of, of scripture. And, and in particular, Psalm 41, verse 9. Now, that's something you should understand about Psalm 41, verse 9. It's a psalm of David. It's a psalm of painful experience. It's a psalm of inner turmoil. In it, David shared of, a, of an illness, a severe illness that he had. And it was made worse in that his enemies tried to soothe him with false words. But inwardly, the, the, these enemies, they desired harm for David. They desired to harm him, but they, they gave him these flattering words to try to soothe him, even though they desired harm for him. And if that wasn't, if that wasn't bad enough, he says this in verse 9. This is the worst part for David. Even my close friend, in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted his heel against me. His close friend. And it's one thing if, if your enemies hate you. Isn't it another thing if your friends turn on you? His close friend, it desires harm for David. If we break down this verse, I think it may have a greater impact. Friend, I mean, friend is a one that is a man of peace between two people, an ally, a companion. It, it, to have a friendship, it speaks of a trusted relationship that is established on mutual trust of one another. And that's what he says, my friend ate my bread. Now think about that. It refers to dependence, doesn't it? He ate my bread. This friend was dependent upon David. And in David's culture, uh, eating the bread of another, especially if one was of higher standing in society, it, it's a pledge of loyalty to eat that person's bread. As you eat their bread, you're pledging your loyalty to that person. It speaks of an intimate, trusting relationship. And it's this one that has pledged his loyalty to David, that has described his friend, that has recognized as a friend, who has lifted his heel. What does it mean to lift his heel? It speaks of violence, it speaks of deceit, it, means, it speaks of treachery and betrayal. It is this one that went against David. David was a, a type or a model pointing to the Messiah. Psalm 2 uh, corroborates this. And what that means is when you're reading the Old Testament and you, you read something of David, that doesn't mean it always applies to Christ. It doesn't mean it always points to 
the coming king. But in general, the themes of David's life did point to his descendant, Jesus. Let me give you an example in verse 4 of Psalm 41. As for me, O Lord, be gracious to me, heal me, for I have sinned against you. Jesus could never say those words. Because Jesus never sinned. But we see that David is a type. But what makes this psalm so interesting is that the backdrop of it is probably 2 Samuel chapter 15 through 17. I encourage you to go home and read it. It's the story of Absalom, his son, his son's conspiracy against his father to betray him. And how David's friend and advisor, Ahithophel, turns on David. And his friend, Ahithophel, not only turns on him, but conspires to kill David. Now, it's important that we see the value of this friend, Ahithophel. You read in, in 2 Samuel chapter 16, verse 23, it says, Now in those days, the counsel that Ahithophel gave was as if one consulted the word of God. So was all the counsel of Ahithophel esteemed both by David and Absalom. In other words, whatever this guy said, whatever this guy advised, you took it to the bank. It was credible. It was good. He, 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 they say here it was as if one consulted the word of God. That's how great this guy's counsel was. I want you to notice the treachery. Verses 1 through 3 in, in 2 Samuel 17. Moreover, Ahithophel said to Absalom, let me choose 12,000 men, and I will arise and pursue David tonight. I will come upon him while he is weary and discouraged and throw him into a panic. And all the people who are with him will flee, and I will strike down only the king. And I will bring all the people back to you as a bride comes home to her husband. You seek the life of only one man, and all the people will be peace. He says, let me strike down the king. Let me throw him into confusion when he's weary, when he's vulnerable, when he's weak. Let me strike his heel. You know, if David was a type pointing to Christ, Ahithophel was a type pointing to Judas. Let me give you one last parallel between he and Judas. Chapter 17, verse 23. When Ahithophel saw that his counsel was not followed, he saddled his donkey and went off home to his own city. He set his house in order and hanged himself. And he died and was buried in the tomb of his father. When Judas betrayed Jesus, he went and hung himself. You see, the scene pointed to a greater scene. And it was fulfilled in the life of Jesus, Jesus and Judas. And Jesus pointed to Psalm 41, 9 and, and stated, it will be fulfilled. In other words, Jesus, as prophet, said this will happen in fulfillment of God's word. Again, we come back to that idea of, of, of the elect. I mean, so clearly Jesus is saying this is going to happen. And he knew it was going to be Judas. This is going to happen because scripture will be fulfilled. You see in several places in John that Scripture will be fulfilled. Now what do we see in this fulfillment? Jesus as our head suffered. Jesus as the head of the church suffered. Jesus as our Lord and our Savior suffered from his friend. He not only set a pattern for sacrificial service, but also in sacrificial living and endurance of the betrayal. And let me just say that understanding this will help you and encourage you in your daily, daily living of prioritizing God regardless of the outcome. Regardless of betrayal is to prioritize God in your life. You know, the apostles would experience this from Pentecost on until they died. And they no doubt drew closer to Christ in identifying with him in his suffering. And Jesus says in verse 19, I'm telling you this now before it takes place, that when it does take place, you may believe that I am he. In other words, don't be discouraged. Don't be discouraged by what happens. The treachery of Judas, it will happen. The cross will happen. 
Jesus was, has told them events are coming, and I have told you that they're coming. I have told you these events are going to happen. And when they do not, when they do happen, do not be discouraged. Remember these words, I am He. In the midst of this, remember, I am He. This is, when He says I am He, this is not one of the typical se uh, of the seven I am statements, like I am the resurrection and the life, I am the way, the truth, and the life. It, this is, this is a, separate from those, but nonetheless it's the same wording. It's mm. th this I am, it, it's the name of God. The context is informing in the midst of trial. Jesus calls his disciples to what? Know and believe that I am God, that I am he. When they would experience death, when they would experience beatings, when they would experience rejection, when they would experience ostracization from society, they could find comfort in knowing that Jesus is I am. I, I tell you, this is love. This is love. This is the love that Jesus has for his own throughout history. Is it any doubt or any wonder that many martyrs went to brutal death singing praise to the Lord Jesus Christ? As Stephen was being stoned to death, did not the presence of I am bring him joy? If to today the church suffers, we only need to be reminded that scripture tells us that it's going to happen. That our history of social rejection and hatred from the world it's actually foretold by Jesus. This is going to happen. And when we look back on scripture and we say, ah, he told us, but he's still God. As we reflect on these things, we reflect on our own life. We must be reminded and comforted by I am. Verse 20 he says, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever receives the one I send receives me, and whoever receives me receives the one who sent me. This is kind of a change in gears. Why does Jesus switch gears here like this? He spoke of treachery and fulfillment of Scripture and the treachery. Well, here's the question. is What did the cross mean to them? What did the cross mean to them? Look at Peter's loyalty to Christ. Peter was willing to fight for Jesus until Jesus was arrested. And then no longer Peter, Peter was no longer willing to fight for him. What happened? Was Peter all of a sudden afraid... Did Peter all of a sudden lose his loyalty? Maybe. But it's unlikely that the cause of his denial of Jesus was fear. What had Peter been hearing Jesus say the whole time as he sends, sends out the disciples? The kingdom is now. The kingdom is in your midst. What are they here? The kingdom is now. They didn't understand the already but not yet aspect of the kingdom. But they hear this is the kingdom is now. We are part of this kingdom. But now the king was arrested. What are we to do? They were sent but the sender is going to hang on a cross. This was confusing for they had their own misconceptions of Jesus' mission and their own role. And so when the king who is the king of the kingdom is arrested... Why did we do all of this? But what does Jesus say here? They're still sent. The mission is still to happen. When the apostles were rejected, they, the ones that were sent, they were to be rejected right along with the one who sent them. And when Christ is rejected, what does he say? The Father is rejected. They were not to be discouraged by this, in other words. If the apostles were rejected, then Christ was rejected and the Father was rejected. You know what's amazing about this verse is that Jesus told the disciples that they were to represent Jesus to the world. That they were to be image bearers. as We're all called to be image bearers because we're all created. All people are created in the image of God. But here, Christ is speaking of sending them to represent himself to the world. I gotta tell you, that is a, a, an amazing responsibility that these 11 were called to represent Christ. They were to represent Christ to the world. What type of life must they have had to have lived in order to represent Christ? 
Christ has just demonstrated the type of life they were to live in any humble service, putting others before self, <coughs> checking pride at the door, washing one another's feet, doing things below one's own selfish, self, social standing. That's what Jesus called them to do in presenting himself to the world through these disciples. I got to tell you, what a calling the disciples had. They're not alone. The disciples aren't alone. Look, the apostles, there are no longer apostles. Last of the apostles died with the apostle John. But the word apostle means sent one. There will forever be sent ones. And we have apostolic authority. It's called the New Testament. But look what Paul says. Therefore, we are ambassadors for who? For Christ. We are ambassadors for Christ. But we have the same call upon us that the disciples had. We, we do. We, we still are to go. We are still to be presenting Christ to a world that has rejected him. And what do we find out? That if they reject us, they reject Christ. If they reject Christ, they reject the Father. You know, we are still to be presenting Christ to the world. That has to be reflected in all aspects of our life, not just merely our words. As we reflect on the love of Christ, we see in our election eternal security. We see eternal security. We are reminded of who Jesus is and what we will experience. We have been given the high calling of, of living lowly. Living lowly is a high calling, by the way. We're not to be caught off guard by rejection. Our mission here of going out is elevated to the importance of, of Jesus' mission because now those who follow Christ are to be His representatives in all the earth. If you are a follower of Christ, if Jesus is your Lord and Savior, you are still an ambassador of Christ to go and proclaim that message. And if you're not a disciple of Christ, maybe the question you have asked this sermon was, Lord, is it I? Lord, is it I? We looked at election and we go, oh gosh, you know, I can't, who could be saved? Well, you know what you do is you ask. You ask God. You ask God, will you save me? Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. You just ask. That's all. You just ask. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I just thank you for your word. I thank you for the truth of it. I thank you for these 20 verses. All that you have taught me. I pray, Father, that, that we all will continually go back and feed at the well the trough of these verses and learn from them. Consider their implications of your love. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for perseverance and you calling us. And there's nothing in me that would, you would desire, Father, but thank you for Jesus in my life. I pray for the one who does not know your son, and I pray that you will draw them at this moment. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.